2016 season was a great microcosm of the eternal debate over the value of a running back. The Cowboys spent the fourth overall pick on an extremely talented tailback in Ezekiel Elliott, while the Bears waited until 146 picks later to take little-known Jordan Howard in the fifth round. Elliott was a national champion and arguably the face of a blue blood program at Ohio State, while Howard only played one year of major college football after two years at UAB, a program that no longer even exists. And yet, despite their completely opposite past the NFL, after their rookie years, they finished as the top two rushers in the entire league. Elliott, of course, had over 300 yards more than Howard, but considering that Howard didn't even start until the fourth week of the season, his production is one of the most incredible stories of the year. He had seven 100-plus yard games and smashed almost every franchise rookie rushing record in the books, eclipsing both Matt Forte and the great Walter Payton. And again, I'll emphasize this, he did it in just 13 starts. That is enormously impressive to me, to be that productive on one of the worst teams in the league while playing in one of the best divisions in the league. But all of this begs the question, how did a fifth round rookie do this? How did he put up such mind boggling numbers week after week? To me, the answer is actually pretty simple, vision and synergy with his offensive line. Howard is a zone runner through and through. He ran zone at UAB, he ran zone at Indiana, and he runs in a zone system with the Bears. He has an excellent feel for reading the leverages of defenders and knowing when to press further to the edge and when to bend the run back to the backside. Knowing how to read these leverages, how to time your cuts, and how to feel the creases develop in real time is the most important skill you can have in a zone system by far. We've seen less physically talented backs succeed before in zone systems simply because they have great vision and patience. Of course, Arian Foster, CJ Anderson, and Alfred Morris all immediately come to mind, and in my opinion, Jordan Howard fits that mold. He's not really that fast, his feet are good but not great, and he isn't as fluid or quick as Ezekiel Elliott, but with his vision and ability to feel those creases, he can be just as effective. And the biggest key to that vision, at least to me, is that he's always in sync with his offensive line. He can look at a defensive front and know before the ball is even snapped how the play is going to be blocked based on their alignment and how he should expect to read and manipulate those blocks. Howard and his center, fellow rookie Cody Whitehair, always seem to be in lockstep with each other on these zone runs, and if your center and running back are that in sync, usually you're going to have success running the ball. Take a look at this inside zone run against the Lions in week four as an example. Third quarter, they've got a weak side inside zone call on after the tight end motions towards the boundary side of the formation. The Lions linebackers shift with the motion to realign with the new strength of the formation, which is what the Bears want anyway, so that's good for them. Detroit has a light box here. It's six blockers on six defenders with both safeties playing deep, so the Bears have a clear numbers advantage in the box. This is literally the ideal defensive look to call this run against. But just because a play call is perfect on paper and you've got a numbers advantage doesn't necessarily mean it's a slam dunk. You've still got to block it right and you've still got to read it right and that's where Howard's synergy with his offensive line comes into play. Notice that this defensive tackle on the play side is lined up in a four eye alignment. This is a really wide alignment and typical of a defensive tackle that's trying to get upfield and penetrate that B gap between the guard and offensive tackle. Now, because no part of that defensive tackle's body is lined up with the frame of the left guard, Josh Sitton, that means that Sitton is what we call an uncovered lineman. To put it simply, his body is not covered by any part of the defensive tackle's body. And this matters because being covered or uncovered changes how this play is blocked and how it's read by Howard. Sitton is working with Cody Whitehair to essentially go two on two with the four eye defensive tackle, as well as the will linebacker Kyle Van Noy. But determining who is responsible for the defensive tackle and who is responsible for the will is based upon who is covered and who is uncovered. If this defensive tackle was lined up as like a three-eye technique or even a two technique like you see from the tackle on the other side, then Sitton would be covered and theoretically try to reach block him to seal him out of the B-gap, then pass him off to Whitehair who would continue that seal while Sitton advanced to the second level to take on the will. That type of block is what is referred to as an ace block, which is a combination block between the play side guard and center. However, because the DT is so wide as a four eye technique, it is virtually impossible for a guard to successfully reach block and pass off someone who is that far away from them. You would honestly need to be superhuman to cross his face and keep him from penetrating that B gap. Unless of course the four eye helps you out a little bit by slanting inside himself and intentionally putting himself in a bad position which this one thankfully does. 
but that's neither here nor there. Let's back it up again to just before the snap. Sitton knows that he is uncovered and that he has almost no legitimate shot to successfully ace block this defensive tackle. And Whitehair also knows that the ace block is off the table because they're communicating with one another via verbal cues like all offensive linemen do. So how this play is going to be blocked changes because of that four-eye alignment. Now Sitton's responsibility is to keep that defensive tackle in the B-gap rather than out of the B-gap, and it's on Whitehair to climb to the second level and take on the Willbacker instead. When the ball is snapped, you see Whitehair looking at that four-eye. He's ready to double-team him to keep him out of that A-gap and make sure that Sitton can pin him back into the B-gap where he belongs. Roll it forward a little bit, and as he's double-teaming him to help Sitton regain control, look at where Whitehair's eyes are. He's locked in on Van Noy all the way, tracking his target while washing down the defensive tackle. So Whitehair's generating movement on the double team, protecting that A-gap, helping out Sitton to do his job. But then with flawless timing, he peels off the double team to take on Van Noy as Howard is pressing the hole. He's perfectly square when engaging, he's sustaining his block downfield, and there is nothing Van Noy can do to stop Howard. He is taken completely out of the play here by Whitehair's well-timed and executed block. And while all of this is going on, let's back it up and watch Jordan Howard himself and how he reads this play. He knows that realistically, there is no way that Josh Sitton is gonna be able to reach block a four-eye technique. He knows that he's gonna have to bend this run back and follow Cody Whitehair, and that affects how he reads this play and sets up his blockers for success. When he takes that handoff, his eyes are peeking at Kyle Van Noy over the top of the line. Howard's trying to press this play side B-gap as hard as possible, because the longer he presses it, the more Van Noy has to respect it which means he's flowing more towards that gap and away from the cutback lane, which helps to give Whitehair better leverage against Van Noy on the second level. As soon as Howard identified that four-eye technique lined up in the front, he knew that he was gonna have to be cutting this run back unless something monumentally stupid happened. But to make the cut to the backside more effective, he had to sell the run to the front side first. That's why he's pressing this hole so long. He's waiting until he's pretty much on top of his left tackle to make this cut, which syncs up perfectly with Whitehair's timing on his block. When you look at the big picture, it's all really impeccably executed, to be honest. And as Whitehair is peeling off to engage Van Noy, you can see Howard put a hand onto his back. He's feeling out that block in real time while trying to read where Van Noy is leveraging himself. If Van Noy takes on the block on Whitehair's front side shoulder, then Howard can easily just bend it back and run off of Whitehair's backside hip, where Kyle Long is doing a pretty decent job of sealing off the pursuit. If Van Noy tries to attack Whitehair's backside shoulder to get into that cutback lane, then Howard can just go frontside and get to the edge for an even bigger game. No matter what at this point, it's gonna be a good run. But if Howard gets to the edge, it can be a great run. And of course, Van Noy does not stay outside, so Howard reads it, then bursts through the hole to the edge for an easy 17-yard game. This run right here is the embodiment of the Bears offense and how well all of the components of their run game work together. Sitton and Whitehair were on the same page frontside, Kyle Long did a great job backside, and Howard pressed the hole harder just to make it easier for all of them to get the best angles to succeed in those blocks. The cut synced up perfectly with the peel, everyone got to their spots on time, and collectively they put Kyle Van Noy in a no-win situation with their execution. This is how a zone run game looks when it's done right, and a lot of the credit should go to this Bears interior offensive line. Their trio of Josh Sitton, Cody Whitehair, and Kyle Long is arguably the best in the entire league. I would put them up against anyone, and that includes the lines for the Cowboys and Raiders. Those three all work together so well, and for Whitehair to step in and take over the pivot position as a rookie, no doubt the most important position on the offensive line for any zone run game, for him to be so good in his first year ever playing center is incredibly impressive. We're going to be talking about him for a long time, I think, as one of the premier centers in the league. Simply put, he was phenomenal, and I think he's going to be a critical piece to this Bears offense for many years to come. But anyway, back to Jordan Howard, who is an equally critical piece for this offense. His vision and patience created a lot of opportunities for him over the course of the season, and his power allowed him to capitalize on those opportunities. I mean, he runs really, really hard. He breaks arm tackles, he throws people off of him when they're trying to hit him high, and he's always falling forward for that extra little bit of yardage. He didn't quite get the same yards after contact as Ezekiel Elliott, but he definitely does not go down easy. With his obvious size and strength, Chicago really likes using him as a goal line back. I think if the Bears offense as a unit can improve enough to give him more total opportunities in the red zone, he should be a double digit touchdown kind of player in 2017. All six of his rushing touchdowns his rookie year were within nine yards of the end zone. 
If he gets just a few more of those types of carries this season with Mike Glennon or even Mitchell Trubisky under center, there's no reason why that number shouldn't go way, way up. He can use that power to score. He can use it to grind clock and move the chains, and he uses it to pass protect as well. There were multiple instances against the Colts where he put blitzers on their ass simply because he's so strong. If you want him to square up and protect the quarterback, he can do just as good of a job as Elliott does in Dallas, no question. That's one of the benefits of having a 230 pound running back with a thirst for contact. He can handle that kind of dirty work without even breaking a sweat. Beyond protecting the quarterback though, he can bail them out as a receiver as well. He catches the ball reliably and can be a really good check down option or even a screen target on third and long. Again, he's not a threat to take any reception to the house on any given play like Elliott is, but Howard can get you yards through the air and keep the offense on schedule. In the modern NFL, that's a pretty valuable skill set to have. My one major complaint about Howard though is exactly what I just said. He's not really a big play threat. He'll get you 10 or 15 yards on the screen, but he's not gonna get you 30 or 40. He'll break off a big run here and there, but don't expect him to take it all the way for a touchdown. He gasses out really easily on those long runs, and that 4-6 speed is very noticeable when he's got defenders running 4-4 chasing him down from behind. Again, he'll get a lot of yards in totality, but just don't expect them to come in huge chunks that often. That's why they drafted Tariq Cohen in the fourth round this year after all. They wanted a big play threat to complement Howard, and that's exactly what Cohen's going to be coming out of the backfield. But on the whole, Howard is still the lead dog in this running back group, and he's still the backbone of this offense. His consistency keeps the unit on schedule, which for a team that honestly still has a lot of growing pains to go through a quarterback, that's exactly what they need more than anything else. Consistency. Is Howard super impressive athletically? No. But in a pure zone run system, he doesn't have to be. He wins with vision, patience, and synergy with his offensive line. As long as those three elements still exist, the Bears run game will be just fine. If there's one thing Chicago's gotten really good at over the decades, it's mashing teams up front and forcing the ball down their throat. Sayers did it, Peyton did it, Forte did it, and now Jordan Howard is primed to take up that mantle himself. I can think of no better player to carry on this great Bears tradition than a fifth round pick with a chip on his shoulder and an appetite for violence. When you think about the history of this team and all they stood for, all that Jordan Howard stands for, it really is a match made in football heaven. All right, thank you for watching. That's all I've got for this week's show. As usual on the screen are all of our wonderful Patreon supporters for this episode. They make the existence of this channel possible, and the more people that are supporting the growth of the film room week after week, the more content I can make and the more I can give back to everyone who believes in the mission of this show. We're still marching towards our long-term goals of helping turn this into a permanent gig, but we're inching closer every week, and that's what's really important. So thank you again to everyone who has donated. I really could not do this without any of you. Next week, we'll have kind of a two-in-one episode. It's sort of fantasy-related for next season, but really, I just want to answer a couple questions for myself after the surprise release of Jeremy Macklin from Kansas City. Most notably, why do they feel so comfortable cutting him? What do they see in Chris Conley and Tyreek Hill on tape? And what should we, the fans, expect from that duo in 2017 as they try to fill the gap left by Macklin's departure? So I'm going to have all that and more for you guys on next Thursday's episode. Until then, later.